So, uh, yes. Yes, there's, there'll be a third lecture tomorrow on how to use the stage uh, to, to work with number theory, and that'll be at 2 o'clock in Lebanon Cafe. Okay, so um, thank you, and thanks to the these two organizers from the wing committee, that three that are over here. Um, so just to emphasize, this talk isn't going to teach you all about how to use Sage, or really tell you very much about the architecture of Sage, or what's in Sage. It's much more a talk about people and um, history. So quick survey: Who here has ever heard of Sage before a few minutes ago? Okay, who has um, actually used Sage? So half the people, and who's contributed code that's in cl that's shipped with Sage? One, two, excellent. Three, me. Okay, so this talk is going to tell you kind of why I started the project and what happened over the years. So here's um, some background that's relevant about me involving um, the project. So I started out as a computer science student undergraduate. I switched at the very last minute when I um, discovered a math book misfiled in the computer science section of a used bookstore. And I discovered math. And then I switched my major. But I was initially a computer science major. Um, and I wrote a lot of code in grad school. I wrote a program called HECA for computing with modular forms. And um, it was pretty popular for that purpose. And I uh, did research on modular forms with various people. Uh, one of the grad students who I went to Berkeley with, uh, David Cole, was he looked at the stuff I was writing, and he was impressed by the modular forms capabilities. But it was kind of ridiculous, because I was writing a command line interpreter for the system. And he said it was kind of a shame that I had to write yet another little programming language. It would be nice if I could just use something that already existed. And he told me about Magma, which he had worked on at University of Sydney in Australia. And um, subsequently, I then went down and worked on Magma three separate times and contributed quite a bit of code to Magma, like all their modular forms functionality and many other things. Um, but there was, I started kind of noticing a problem with Magma, which is that, uh, well, basically all the software that I used was open source, everything, like my LaTeX environment, my operating system, my web browser, absolutely everything except the one and only program I actually cared about for my um, mathematical research, which was uh, Magma. So I was a little frustrated by that. And this really had uh, real implications. I could look at the code of Magma because I worked with them. But um, other people I knew who I was collaborating with couldn't. Also, it was uh, very difficult for people to use what I wrote for Magma because Magma was expensive. Not only was it expensive, it was hard to buy. Even if you happily had the money, they didn't. you couldn't just you know, go online and buy it. You had to email somebody, hope they would write back to you, and then there would be some complicated exchange in which money would eventually be exchanged, like $1,000, and then you would get access to an FTP server, and you would download Magma. And it was really a, a complicated process. So um, one thing I did for a little while was I created a site where you could uh, put Magma code into a web page and then see the results. And this at least made it easy for students and other people to use Magma to get a basic sense of uh, computations without having to buy it. And I, I did that with their permission. Um, but it still is just a frustrating situation. But I should say that now Simon is giving it for the university for free. That's true. In North America, if you want to get access to Magma, so at an academic institution in North America, and you're willing to do the appropriate paperwork and get your chair signature and all that, you are, in theory, supposed to be able to download a copy of Magma. So there you are. Uh, I'll come back to that later. So in 2004, when I was starting to get frustrated with Magma being closed source, there was an enormous conference at IHP in Paris um, it was a Magma conference in which people came together and talked about the research they were doing with Magma. I gave some talks. Um, many other people gave some nice talks. By the way, that's what I look like with long hair and no beard, in case you're curious, in the middle, not on, the, not on your left. Um, so one uh, guy who gave a really cool talk about quadratic forms was this guy, Manjul Bhargava, who you've all heard of. Um, and he talked about you know, a theorem he was trying to prove involving representability of numbers by quadratic forms. And he mentioned how I really ran into a brick wall in certain cases using Magma. 
maybe he could have got past these brick walls if he and his collaborator, um, John Hankey, could have uh, changed the code of magma. But they couldn't because they were just kind of users of magma, pain, pain users. Um, so what happened was John Hankey ended up putting an enormous amount of effort in to writing a beautiful package for computing with quadratic forms that over the years got included in Sage. Um, and he did that while he was tenure track at University of Georgia. And the result is that he didn't get tenure. He ended up leaving. He now works at Goldman Sachs. Uh, Manjul didn't write quadratic forms code, but he got a Fields Medal. So here are the people. So the, the four systems, Magma, Maple, Mathematica, and MATLAB that really, in 2004, when I was thinking about wanting something open source, um, are, well, these, the three on the lower right are the founders uh, or co-founders of each of those programs. On the upper left is Alan Steele, who you'll rarely hear his name. And he's not the, you know, like the founder of Magma, but he's, in fact, the mastermind and kind of cracked C programmer, as he calls himself, behind the implementation of a lot of Magma. And he's the reason that a huge amount of Magma is really fast and efficient. Um, this is a picture I took of him when we went hiking in Australia. Um, but these, uh, just to give you a, a sense of some of the, the software, and of course, Stephen Wolfram is very proud to be Scientist of the Year, as you can see in the lower left. I've met all these people except the MATLAB person, who's Moeller. So um, here's a little quote by Stephen Wolfram, which is um, kind of disturbing. And here it is. So you should realize, this is on their website right now, you should realize at the outset that while knowing about the internals of Mathematica may be of intellectual interest, it is usually much less important in practice than you might at first suppose. Indeed, in almost all practical uses of Mathematica, issues about how Mathematica works inside turn out to be largely irrelevant. Particularly in more advanced applications of Mathematica, it may sometimes seem worthwhile to try to analyze internal algorithms in order to predict which way of doing a given computation will be the most efficient. But most often, the analysis will not be worthwhile. So how about if you think about reading that but replacing the internals of Mathematica by proofs? Imagine telling your students that. You should realize at the outset that while knowing how to prove theorems may be of intellectual interest, it's usually much less important in practice than you might first suppose. Indeed, in almost all practical uses of mathematics, issues about how theorems work inside turn out to be largely irrelevant, particularly in more advanced mathematics. It sometimes may seem worthwhile to understand a proof in order to uh, understand something more better, but most often the analysis will not be worthwhile. For mathematics is quite complicated. I mean, that's what he's saying about mathematical software. And pretty much, especially in 2004, I would say the whole math community bought into that hook, line, and sinker. And pretty much the same today. I don't know. Things have changed somewhat, but not, not uniformly. Um, so one other thing happened in 2004, which really surprised me. So I was a postdoc. And then suddenly, I got a job with tenure. Not a tenure track job, but a, do a job with tenure. I didn't expect that to happen at all. And um, basically, what happened was I, I went to interview for my first job at Penn State. And the chair sat me down in the morning. And he said, we are going to offer you a job with tenure. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, that's my fantasy of how this is supposed to work. And I was a little shocked that it actually worked that way for me. Um, so I contacted some of the other places that expressed it, had expressed interest in me and told them this. And some places were like, oh, that's interesting. Um, we no longer have any interest in you whatsoever. That's what, in fact, a lot of places said, um, that there was no possible way they would consider hiring me with tenure. But um, UCSD was another place that was interested in me, and they made an offer as well with tenure, and I took it. And um, I suddenly thought, hmm, I could maybe write an open source system that will allow me to switch from using Magma to something open source. Um, that would be nice, because everything else I use is open source. And in 2004, there was a really clear wave of success in open source. Linux was doing really well on the server, and LaTeX and so on were really doing well. Um, this was a little piece of paper that I was scribbling on in a conference. And it's when I came up with the name Sage. So you can see it right here. So I'm like, need a better name. I was writing some software and calling it Manin, because Manin, this Russian mathematician you've all heard of as well, 
had inspired a lot of the work I, um, a lot of the algorithms that I did. So I was thinking pi math, eh, sage. That was like my second idea. And um, I realized how easy it is to come up, for acronym, come up with acronyms for the word sage. So uh, system for arithmetic geometry experimentation. And I figured if that didn't work out, it'd be really easy to come up with another one. I mean, it's like the, a really nice word. And also, my wife is Navajo, and I see a lot of sage around because it's a, a sacred Navajo herb. So I thought, OK, sage. Um, so that's where the name comes from in 2004, or yeah, late 2004. Sorry for that stupid little bubble. Um, so I chose it with that acronym. And then I launched it. And of course, initially, I was the only user. And then there were two other people that kind of tried to use it. One, one guy contributed, David Cole, who I mentioned quite a while ago. Uh, I don't know if he really used it for anything, but he wrote code. Then this other guy, David Joyner, who, um, by the way, wrote a really nice book on Rubik's Cube. Um, he's a mathematician at US Naval Academy. Um, he's a coding theorist. He started using Sage and also contributing a lot of code. So, and he, um, not being an arithmetic geometer at all, he was contributing things involving undergrad differential equations and group theory. And so very quickly, with developer number one after me, because um, I'm developer number zero, I guess, um, the uh, sort of scope of what Sage would be became much broader than just exactly the number theory that I'm interested in. Um, by the way, I started at the very beginning, I had planned to, I spent about a year investigating what language to write Sage in and prototyping various algorithms in a wide range of different uh, systems. And you know, I tried, I, was, I almost chose OCaml, for example, um, but I ended up arriving on Python with um, a method of writing extensions to Python called Pyrex, which I later forked and started as a new project called Cython, which has a lot more development momentum. Um, so I spent a lot of time benchmarking different possibilities. And then when I was ready to go, I, I remember sitting down in my office. My plan was to simply look at source code of existing open source systems and at books and implement stuff, which had worked perfectly for me I mean, that's what I did in my thesis work because I was, you know, spending years learning about modular forums, figuring out how to come up with algorithms for them, and nobody had implemented similar things. But so I took this, the source code of Paris and looked at the elliptic curve, you know, file and C and started trying to implement stuff. And this lasted about 45 minutes before I got frustrated with how slow it was. Because um, it was, I mean, it would take decades and decades to write something with that approach. Uh, you only ever do that if it's your only option. So what I, I shifted to doing instead was putting a lot of work into making Perry very efficiently usable from Python. And um, expanded not just Perry, but Gap, Maxima, Singular, uh, et cetera. And there's quite a few different components. This had lots of advantages. One, um, well, first, by using Python, I got to use a mainstream programming language rather than writing my own. I had implemented an interpreter once when I was a CS undergrad major. And I realized that it's just a pain in the ass. It's a lot of work. I don't want to do that. So I needed a shortcut, which was just use Python. And I guessed out of all the languages back then, I, my, I basically bet Python would be the one to emerge. Um, and it also was the most similar to Magma. So I went with it. And I could write fast code for Python by writing it in extension languages. Python has turned out over the years to be like the best possible imaginable choice I could have made at the time. So I was very lucky there. Um, it wasn't luck, though, because I spent a year investigating the options. And I got the right one. And maybe introducing Cython and pushing it helped. Python to be popular. Um, so, uh, so I started Sage, I got it going, and I got another developer. Um, this is an example of a talk I gave at PyCon in 2005. So I, you know, I went in there, I told him I'm going to write amazing software for arithmetic geometry. You know, I told him what arithmetic geometry is for Maslow's theorem, all this other stuff. These were a bunch of computer programmers. And I told him what the problem was, the goal, and some of the other software. And then they... Uh, all the comments and questions are all about like how you could take basically handwritten math and maybe turn it into ASCII characters. I mean, it was like it had nothing to do <laughs> with what I was talking about um, at all. And I, I ended up I talked at a lot of Python user group meetings and stuff about Sage, and um, you know their their concerns are utterly completely different than the concerns of like research mathematicians. Um, and I even ho I remember hosting one of the PyCon meetings or not PyCon but one of the um, Python meetups in. Uh, Boston, right in the Harvard math department, which was kind of fun. Okay, so then um, Sage launches, and there's a little bit of backlash. So first, John Cannon, who's the uh, director of the founder of Magma, 
writes to me on Christmas Day, actually, and says, this is to formally advise you that your permission to run a general purpose calculator based on magma expires on December 31st, 2005. This was originally set up at your request so students in your course at Harvard could have easy access to magma. So um, something that was my fear, maybe I, I like to make interactive websites in which you can use math software, you might have noticed. Um, if I tried to build up, you know, spending years and years of work, build up some amazing interactive websites, and at the core, they use magma behind the scenes, at any point, uh, John Cannon could just tell me, no, you can't do that, and everything's destroyed. And literally, he actually did that when he found out about Sage. So um, that was really weird, but it happened. And I, st I took down the site. Um, and then somebody else found out about Sage, this uh, computer science professor at, it's very uh, mean computer science professor at, <laughs> at Berkeley. He looks mean, he's mean. His daughter's like some really intense punk rock girl. Um, but he's also one of the main reasons that Maxima is open source. So he's in fact a, um, you know, a very important contributor to open source math software over the years. So he's not to be annoyed, uh, ignored. Um, and I've had many uh, very intense sort of online arguments with him. An intense open source, source person. Yes, yes, he's very intense. So uh, here's what he wrote. Um, basically, he said, by avoiding applications, say to engineering, design, finance, education, scientific visualization, SAGE is essentially doomed. Why? Government funding for people or projects will be a small percentage of the funding for pure math. That's not much. The future is pretty grim. So that's what he said. Um, his point being that because Sage was really, I mean, Sage really is aimed at pure mathematics. It's not um, NumPy or MATLAB or it's not, though we like to um, say that Sage overall should compete with MATLAB and Mathematica and so on, only in so far, we're, we're the people providing the pure math part of Sage. It really isn't aimed at uh, applications in engineering design and so on. Um, and so he's just pointing out that getting funding is, is hard. He knows it because Maxima is also similarly I mean, it, it's more applied than Sage, but it's still pretty, pretty problematic. Um, so my feeling was I'd prove him wrong. The pure math community would certainly contribute a lot to Sage, and is, is, I mean, my experience with the pure math research community, especially number theory, was extremely positive. Um, like I hear about people in physics and other areas with all the infighting and competition and stuff. And in in number theory, at least, if you ever find another number theorist kind of doing trying to solve the same problem as you or doing the same thing, there's like a 100% chance you're going to write a collaborative paper with them. Um, so it's a really, really uh, nice community. So that was my experience. And in fact, here's what happened at the first Sage days. Uh, do you have a question? No, I'm just going to ask, um, just in, in your opinion, do you think in the future, let's say, um, do you think it's possible to extend Sage to include, you know, maybe a limited part of people who do want to use it for applications without sacrificing the core of so, staking? His question is, could Sage be extended to include people that want to use, want to do applications? Sage is an enormous Python library, and Python does do a lot in applications. But So it's not necessary. It's already been done, but we don't get the funding for that. The people doing it get the funding for that. We're pure mathematicians. Um, they don't even use Sage. They use the parts that they need, which aren't in Sage. Um, are, are, sorry, they're in Sage, but they're not developed by us. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's counterproductive to just pretend like, well, I got one grant ever from, uh, for like a Sage postdoc, like a 50% time person, and the application said we were going to do all this numerical computing stuff, numerical analysis stuff for Sage, and we didn't because we didn't know what we were doing in that area. That's not our stuff at all. Um, so we never got any more grants that way. But you can only check the NSF twice, not once or twice, which is how we funded Sage. Um, so here's the first stage days, which was I got an NSF grant to do number theory research, and I spent it on getting a bunch of people together to talk about Sage. Like I invited people from GAP and all these other projects, and um, uh, it's a lot of really interesting people, like just in that room. Like the guy off to the left, he was the head of networking in OS 10. Like he wrote the networking stuff for OS 10. Um, so he's an old Apple engineer. He worked there. Um, okay, David Cole, I keep mentioning, is right in the middle here. The guy who wrote Sage Tech is right there. So anyways, we have, we've had nearly 90 Sage days over the years since this first one. 
So here's the mission statement. This is our, um, a, a statement of the goal with Sage to help clarify our direction. Create a viable, free, open source alternative to Magma. That's what I wanted. Really, for me, just a small piece of Magma. Um, Maple, Mathematica, and MATLAB. That's the goal. It's kind of a horrible goal to get grants, though, because first, people that love those systems, and there are a lot, um, will very much want to shoot down your grant proposal because they want to defend their system. And also, there's nothing here about doing anything new. In fact, we're almost declaring we're not going to do anything that somebody else didn't already do. We're just going to try to figure out how to do it as quickly. So it actually is a terrible goal for that point of view, but it also clarifies things. If you ever ask, you know, should something be in Sage, if, the arc, if somebody points out that, yes, it's right there in Magma, then the answer is yes. It's really simple. So um, it really defines what Sage is supposed to do. It also clearly states that Sage is competing with these closed source commercial programs rather than with the other open source programs. And this is a huge thing because in 2004 uh, and 2005, the various open source programs tended to compete with each other to the detriment of all of them. So instead, they're all together now making Sage better. So we have a vested interest in making all of them better. They have a vested interest in us being better. And we're all competing with the closed source ones, which is a way better position to be in. And just to summarize, our goal is to give you a free open source alternative. It's like, I don't know if you remember Internet Explorer was like the web browser you had to use. And then Firefox came along. And finally, you had a free open source alternative. And then Google Chrome came along. And then you had an alternative to Firefox. OK, so the next year I, went, I moved from UC San Diego to University of Washington because my wife was a grad student at University of Washington. And I built a badass team there of people who worked on Sage. It was pretty amazing. Like, I gave a little talk in an undergrad thing. And, there, and like, um, the, a few days later, hired five undergrads, who all, every single one of which ended up making tons of useful contributions to Sage. And so there's some people here who are grad students and undergrads. Several people here work at, are in the picture now work at Google or other interesting places. Um, so um, that's the problem, though. They all, they all got really good at Sage, wrote amazingly deep stuff all over in Sage, and then graduated. And um, I think some of them would have very happily continued to work on Sage. But instead, they all went to work at Google or Apple or other places. Um, and also, like there was a lot of publicity for Sage around this time. And, People assumed that I had tons of grant funding for Sage. Like I remember once Jack Lee, who um, you know, he wrote a, a really uh, famous book, uh, Differential Geometry, and he has a huge Mathematica package for this sort of thing. He came by my office and he said, I want to rewrite my whole Mathematica package for Sage. Um, I'm like, awesome. And he's like, so this is how much my salary is per month for the summer. And I was like, oh, I don't have any money. And he was like, wow, OK. And he kind of left. And like, there's, I, I could go on and tell you dozens, I, I think, over the years of things like that that have happened, where by simple lack of money, absolutely amazing, talented people simply couldn't spend the time to contribute to Sage. It was really, really frustrating. At the beginning, I didn't, it didn't hurt me, but I don't know. Somehow, it happens enough, and you start realizing the missed opportunities, and it gets frustrating. And um, I think my frustration came to a crescendo just a little bit after this, in 2012. By the way, we now have a person, finally, who works full time on Sage. Eric Bray, and even another one now, Jeroen Demeyer. Um, there's a big grant in Europe called Open Dream Kit that they got a little over a year ago, and it does fund a couple of positions on Sage uh, development. And Eric is working really hard porting Sage to Windows. Um, and he's incredibly good. And he has nothing to do with math. He's like, he was doing, he was the head of some astronomy project, and then the uh, Open Dream Kit people hired him to do this instead. So it's purely, he's like a mercenary. He's incredibly technically good. And because we have money, he's working and doing amazing stuff for Sage. If we didn't have money, we would be getting nothing from him. And these are the sort of people that we need a lot of. And in fact, we have only two. Um, there's a, so there's a, there's a broader story about open source software here. So, there's, so if you look at the MAs, they get the software I mentioned above. They get um, roughly a billion dollars a year in revenue overall per year. Um, there's, if you look at the um, open source world, it's not quite so good. Um, so here's another thing. I don't know if you heard about this a few years ago. There's something called Heartbleed. It was, in some sense, maybe the worst security bug ever. So there was a bug in OpenSSL, which was really devastating. And 
um, some guy was sitting there at Google auditing the OpenSSL source code for some reason. He just, I don't know why. And he noticed this bug and he, um, you know, figured out that it could be exploited and then he eventually, you know, told the world. And then people suddenly thought, what is OpenSSL anyways? Where does this, what are this, it's like the basic security software that encrypts connections between web browsers and user and, you know, the servers and also a lot of other stuff. And so people wondered, there's like tons of, uh, you know, multi hundred billion dollar companies that build that are using open SSL all day long every day so they, so people start wondering hmm, I wonder what this what is the open SSL company doing why do they have a bug and so somebody started talking to them and there was an interview with the guy Steve Marquis the lead developer of open SSL and he said there should be at least a half dozen full-time open SSL team members not just one able to concentrate on the care and feeding of open SSL without having to hustle commercial work if you're a corporate or government decision maker in a position to do something about it, give it some thought. Please, I'm getting old and weary. So basically, OpenSSL is being propped up by one or two people in their spare time, and they were trying to hustle random consulting jobs. So they had time left over to work on OpenSSL. That was the situation. It was ridiculous. And I was worried math software might end up in a similar situation. We were doing a little better because we had some NSF support at the time, I basically, I kind of feel like I hacked the NSF and that I had all these grants for number theory and other things and then just used them for Sage development. Um, that kind of ran out though. Uh, so I was incredibly excited in 2012. I got this um, email from David Eisenbud, who is the chair of the Simons um, Foundation. And he said the following, we're going to have a, a round table at the Simons Foundation headquarters in, in Manhattan. The purpose of this round table is to investigate what sorts of support would facilitate the development deployment and maintenance of open source software used for fundamental research in mathematics. The scale of foundation support could be substantial, perhaps up to several million dollars per year. So Jim Simons, of course, has made many, many, many billions. Um, he has the most successful hedge fund of all time he founded. Um, and he's been very generous to the math and physics communities, um, setting up, like, there's a beautiful institute in... Um, in Berkeley, and there's uh, lots of fellowships and jobs and stuff that he has funded. And I don't know, it just sounds really cool, a round table. I, know, I feel like a knight. So we all went to the round table. Um, and of course, going to the meeting, you think a lot about, I mean, if somebody says, we're going to spend a few million dollars a year finally solving this problem, and they clearly have the money to do it, you start dreaming about what you might actually do with a few million dollars a year, which is something I never even let myself do up until this point. So I started thinking, wow, if I had some reasonable funds, I could hire that guy back from Google, that my grad student who wrote the coercion model in Sage, who's the lead developer of Cython, who's spending all of his time making Google search 0.001% faster or something like that. Um, actually, one of the guys in there in the picture is working at Google, and he's making the spell checker 0.001% better in, Goog in uh, Google right now. Um, he works on the spell check team. But... Um, so I started dreaming a little bit bigger than I had before. And uh, we had the meeting um, and the decision, the way in which they decided to spend several million dollars a year funding open source math software is fund magma for all North American academic institutes, as you said. So this cost $90,000 per year. And um, it uh, is the worst possible outcome I could have imagine besides them killing all the developers they invited at the meeting <laughs> but like the most the worst reasonable outcome I could have possibly imagined for the meeting because Magma's closed source a lot of the motivation for the people who worked on Sage in America was not was lack of access to Magma people would want to do work on their thesis or something they'd find Magma was expensive or um, difficult to get access to and then they'd find Sage and then they would write something in Sage that they needed and then contribute it so um, it was just like, are you serious? That's how you're going to do what you said in the letter? Maybe you don't realize that Magma is closed source. Um, I explained this all to David, but he said it was already decided. Uh, so I was frustrated. Um, by the way, I, I uh, you know, David's a great guy, and he's not the um, head of the Simons Foundation anymore, and I don't know whether he, I don't know why he decided that that's what they were going to do, or even if he decided it. I just don't know. Um, but now uh, Yuri Schinkel, uh, he's now the director of the Simons Foundation. So I, I wrote to him and I asked, um, 
Well, people kept telling me, I'm sure that they, you know, fund Sage. It's such an awesome project. Approach them. I'm, literally, people write, I'm 100% sure they will fund Sage on the spot. So I had to write to Yuri. It would be really stupid if I didn't even bother to write. So I just kind of wanted an update on what the situation was. And he wrote to me and he said, before I joined the foundation, there was a meeting conducted by David to discuss possible projects in this area, including Sage, which, of course, that's the meeting I was at. And he was also at it via video conference. Um, after that meeting, it was decided that the foundation would support Magma. Please keep me in the loop. I regret that we will not fund at Sage at this time. So that was kind of frustrating. Um, so let's just step back for a minute. Where has Sage got? Um, so it's a little frustrating that we're not getting money, but you know, Sage, the usage of Sage has grown quite a lot. That line right there is the number of active users of the sagemath.org website. It's it's hard to define how many users you have. You could say look at downloads or some other metric. Um, this is a, or you can look at like total number of visitors ever to your site. That would be a really bad metric. This is a real metric though. It's the number of active users, the people that come, keep coming back to the site. They come back because they want to download another version. They want to find something in the documentation. They want to find a link to a support group or something like that. It's not, e it's not the exact number of users, but it's a function of the number of users, probably a useful function. And you can see it went up pretty quickly until about 2011, and then it has been completely flat ever since. On the other hand, just to give you a sense of scale, the line in the middle is 50,000. So the number of active users is about 60,000 overall for Sage. And it's stuck at that amount. It's kind of saturated the market of, of people that use it. Um, there's more than 60,000, There's sorry, there's less than 60,000 know, pure math researchers in the world, I think maybe way less than 60,000. So you know there's a lot of grad students using it. You can see some by people outside of um, math departments and some in classes, but it's really been stuck now for six years. Um, and it might be, you might, for all of you or for anybody besides me, maybe people would be very happy in, with this and they're, they're done. We're like, okay, so, okay, we're not gonna be a viable alternative to Mathematica and Maple. Um, but at least we're really useful for research math and combinatorics and, and number theory um, and, and a couple of other areas. Uh, recently, we have a lot of new functionality in manifolds. But, um, but that's not my goal at all for the project. I, wanted to, I want Sage to be a viable alternative to Mathematica and you know, Maple and so on. And um, they, I think they have a little bit more than 50,000 active users. I mean, if you look at their website, you can look at comparative website traffic, they really do have around a million active users just on their website per month, each of these systems. They also have about a billion dollars in revenue. You can work back from that to get a sense of how many users they have. Everything kind of works out to on the order of a million to a couple million users. And so Sage has a very small number of users compared to those systems. Yes? Does they have a million combined or? No, I think each one. Yeah, on the order of. So if Sage were genuinely a viable alternative to Mathematica, and it's free, whereas Mathematica costs a typical university maybe $40,000 at least for a site license, and MATLAB costs maybe $150,000 for a site license, there's something, so clearly we're not doing the job. It's not a viable alternative. You can't make something free that's far less popular than something that's extraordinarily expensive and is orders of magnitude more popular. I mean, it's just deluding yourself to think otherwise. And so I don't like to delude myself, and I don't think that we're at all satisfying our, our, our goals. At least my goals. Nonetheless, Sage development. Um, so if you really look at like really advanced mathematics type stuff going into Sage, um, this is a the, at the very top in green. That is a record of the number of commits to the math, to Sage over as a function of time. So there was a lot in the beginning. Kind of went down for quite a while from 2010 to 2013, and then it went up. And it's actually there's more development activity going on right now than ever before. So there's a huge amount of contributions, especially in um, various specific areas that have um, completely bought into Sage, like algebraic combinatorics. It's huge there. Um, and you can see, so overall, the uh, contributors, I'm, I've contributed the most code to Sage. And then number two is Jeroen Demeyer. He's one of the full-time people in Belgium. He's actually deleted more lines than he's added, which is pretty cool. It's the only one up there that's done that. Um, there's a, a couple of other people here. And if you look at just recent history, I'm not even in the top 10. Um, and Frederick Chapotin, who he's a guy in France. I've never met him. 
And he's the top contributor to Sage in the last year. So in fact, all the people at the top except uh, Copa are in Europe. Um, Copa's at UC Davis, but he's German. So uh, Europeans are doing a lot of, are contributing immensely to Sage. It's great that Sage itself is continuing to develop a lot. The stuff they're doing makes Sage a lot better, especially for research in those areas. But I don't think it'll it'll really have any impact at all on going from 50,000 active users to 100,000 or more, um, which I think is a very worthy goal, um, and would really be good for everyone. Because wouldn't it be cool if the the software you can genuinely really use in your calculus teaching, your linear algebra teaching, also has by far the most powerful functionality for algebraic combinatorics and other things, and is open source, so you can read all of it. Um, Sage is really behind Magma. There are many things in Sage, in Magma that I specifically want, that I care about, that are not in Sage yet. And this is a source of great frustration to me. Um, the algebraic combinatorics people kind of en masse switched over to Sage. Why? Because one undergrad at Harvey Mudd spent a year porting most of, like ha over half of their code to Sage, Michael, or Michael Hansen. And then they kind of followed suit because um, the system they were using, MuPad, was bought out by MATLAB and suddenly became very expensive. So they're like, uh-oh, we need to do something. So they all switched to Sage uniformly and with great organization um, and implemented the everything they had and have done a lot more. In number theory, a lot of, most of the kind of like number theorists that I, you know, a lot of number theorists still use Magma for the sorts of things that I wanted Sage to be a viable alternative to Magma for. So that's pretty frustrating. And the, the algorithms, um, in arithmetic geometry, just really, a lot of them are really deep. They take years to implement and multiple people. And um, they're really just painful to implement. And if a person say, say they spend a year doing it for Magma once, they really don't want to do it again um, in Sage. So unfortunately, it's just not happened in a lot of cases. Um, but open source can win. Here's some examples of open source winning. Um, see some of those lines go down. The blue line going down really badly is Internet Explorer. That's the market share of that web browser. And there's a green line going up really quickly. That's Google Chrome. Um, Google Chrome's open source and sponsored by Google. And Internet Explorer's closed source and sponsored by Microsoft. Um, there's also interesting Firefox, which was really popular for a while, has uh, lost a huge amount of market share. Because they decided, despite being their kind of flagship product, Mozilla decided to focus on mobile, basically competing with Google on mobile phones, mobile operating systems, and stuff like that. Because they saw that it was the future. But Google also saw that it was a future, and Google is a little more competitive. And somehow, Mozilla also switched from being funded by Google to being funded by Yahoo. So they've made some weird moves. But they announced a few weeks ago they're going to focus on Firefox again, which is great. So Firefox should get a lot better soon. Um, R is a great example of math, but really statistics software that's been um, fantastically successful. It's now kind of the de facto standard in statistics. Um, it's really, really good. Uh, there's thousands of packages in R. Um, but coming back to uh, Stephen Wilfram quotes, here's one that I used to think was totally wrong and strongly disagreed with. Now I think he's right, actually. Um, so notice both Chrome and R have strong corporate support. One of the biggest um, backers of R is Microsoft. There was a company, R Evolution, that spun off from Yale Bunch of people, they did a lot of stuff to improve R and make R more usable. Then Microsoft bought them a couple of years ago. And so um, big companies are really a, when they, if a company has a vested interest in certain open source being good, there's a chance for that open source software to survive. Um, so here's what Stephen Wolfram says back in 1993. It's kind of a funny quote in retrospect. The mathematical community sort of hate one aspect of what I've done, which is to take intellectual developments and make a company out of them and sell things to people. My own view of that, which has hardened over the years, is, my god, that's the right thing to do. If you look at what's happened with tech, for example, which went in the other direction, open source, free, well, Mathematica could not have been brought to where it is today if it had not been done as a commercial effort. The amount of money that has been spent to do all the details of development, you just can't support that in any other way than this unique American idea of the entrepreneurial company. So I definitely thought he was completely wrong when I first saw this statement. And obviously, tech has been incredibly successful. I was going to ask, what does he think went wrong with tech? Maybe in 1993, the situation wasn't so good. You know, tech has had an 
enormous amount of support from the American Math Society, especially their publication arm, which is a, which makes a lot of money. So um, it kind of fits what I'm what I'm arguing, which is that it's hard for open source to get anywhere without some commercial support. Uh, remember, it's 1993. Tech has turned out very successfully. Um, yeah, well, but it's true that then the commercial versions of tech were not working so well, but the, the open source yeah, versions it's like were a, working better. It's a great counterexample to what I was saying. They and you could also say LaTeX is a good, I mean, sorry, yeah. Linux is a good example of open right. source. But yeah. he's not arguing about open source versus closed source here. Um, he's arguing about uh, the American idea of the entrepreneurial company versus uh, well, user groups like text, Tug. Text very different from that yeah. Yep. So there's that. In any case, I think there's something here, and he is kind of right about something, which I really, really wanted to prove him wrong, and I have failed um, to do so. And, you know, like, the company he has, Wolfram, has about 800 employees, and they really are able to polish a lot of aspects of Mathematica and the surrounding infrastructure in a way that we're not, we have not successfully done with Sage, which makes it more accessible. And they have, you know, like, things like Wolfram Alpha are really very useful. And we just don't have the resources to make something like that um, yet. Uh, here's a okay. Here's an interesting email. We're almost up to now. Dear Professor Stein, this was written to me by um, somebody. I'm a relatively new assistant professor in math with a heavy software bent, and I can't help but note your frustration with grants. Uh, to put it mildly, I find this concerning as my software output is by far my biggest effort and output. And then he asked me if you were a new faculty member again. Would you start something like Sage Math Cloud sooner or simply leave for industry? And you know, I hadn't really thought about that question, but I had to answer yes, I would have um, started. And we, we did consider starting a company back in 2008, and then we decided not to do it. But if I had, I'd probably be a lot farther along than I am now. Um, so I answered him, and then he wrote back. He said, I'm sitting on an offer from Google. I'm increasingly frustrated by continual evidence that it is more valuable to publish papers with no source code than to actually develop software. Um, deep mathematical software is not appreciated by mathematicians or the public. I had been on the fence about accepting the offer and this conversation led me to make the difficult decision. And so he then, he now works at Google. His name's Jack Paulson. Um, and he, I checked up on him last night. He is still contributing a lot to open source software, which is really cool. Um, he has uh, a lot of activity on GitHub. But there are some subtleties that he told me, which I'm not allowed to say anything about. So I won't. But you can use your imagination. Um, I'm going to skip that. OK, here's another quote from Travis Oliphant. Every great open source math library is built on the ashes of someone's academic career. He's, he's basically an example of this. He was a professor, at, or a, sorry, a tenure track professor at Brigham Young University. Um, he wrote a library called NumPy, which is probably the single most important and foundational library in all of scientific computing for Python. And I remember one year when I met him, he was you know, winning a prize from the scientific Python com um, community for writing NumPy at this uh, conference at Caltech. And I was also asked to write a letter supporting his tenure case. And I you know, wrote how important what he was doing was, and they denied him tenure. And so he had to leave academia. He had to. And he, um, he ended up going to working for a company in Texas that does Python consulting. And then after many years of doing that, he started his own company and foundation and um, has also got a lot of venture capital money for his new company in recent times, a terrifying to me amount, like $30 million or something. So he's really going big. Um, we'll see what happens. So is his company around software? Yes, it's around scientific computing using Python and Python software. And they get grants from the government. They borrow lots of money. They have investors. Hopefully, they will be very successful. It's all, and it does a lot for open source software. He's hired like every kind of everybody he could find, and it's like if I could hire all of the amazing people and who have contributed to really cool stuff in pure math um, around the world. He's done that with the venture capital he's got, but for the scientific Python community. There's just tons of people all over the world that are working remotely for his company. Um, so it's doing a lot for open source right now. Uh, here's an example, by the way, of this was uh, posted yesterday. This is the lead developer of Octave. Octave is, a, is an open source competitor to MATLAB. It lets you run most, like if you just open a book on, on MATLAB or a 
go to a MATLAB tutorial, you can take the code and just run it and it will work. It's very good if you're a student and you're doing MATLAB-like stuff for a course, or if you want to run 5,000 copies of MATLAB to do some computation and you don't want to pay for 5,000 licenses. <clears throat> so here's what he says. It's been a great experience uh, working on Okta for 25 years. I'd love to continue as the benevolent dictator for life, lead developer, but I also need to find a way to pay the bills. It's hard to believe that I, um, that's been 25 years, but I have to face the reality of my financial situation. I am using personal savings to maintain my ability to contribute to Octave development. I need to find a way to generate significant funding for my work on Octave or find a non-Octave job. So he works on Octave. It's very similar to MATLAB for m most educational uses. People spend about a billion dollars a year on MATLAB. They spend almost nothing on Octave, and the leader of the project is having to possibly quit, depending on what happens here. It's kind of weird. Um, so to conclude, uh, I decided to, in June, to leave academia to build a company. And that's what I've been doing. Academia, personally, to me, has been very good. They gave me a job with tenure. I've got, a pri I got prizes. Um, but the problem is I don't know how to keep all the other people that I recruit. I don't know how to get postdocs. If, it's, if, if I was doing something that was just me, it would be fine. But it's not just me. Um, so basically, I want, I want to successfully compete with these companies, Maple, Mathematica, MATLAB, that have a billion dollars a year in revenue. And that's just incredibly difficult to do within the constraints of academia. Even if NSF gave me all of their money for every program um, in you know, pure math, they probably wouldn't be nearly the budget that the math software companies, the direct competition, have. So, I mean, they have some advantages by having that much money. Um, they're, and they're very real advantages. It's uh, silly to ignore them. So I'm starting a company. The company is doing, um, the main product of the company right now is Sage Math Cloud, which is what I demoed yesterday. And um, I think that it is insanely hard to build a company that makes any money at all. And um, if it does make a lot of money, that money can be used to support open source math software development. However, I don't feel like it's impossible. Whereas I feel like successfully competing with these companies um, purely from within academia without starting a company, I, I'm, a, I'm at my wit's end. It's totally impossible for me. So at least I'm trying something that has a... It's like buying a lottery ticket, but at least you have a chance, right? So, um, of course, so I announced I'm doing this, and then some people like seriously attack me for doing so, believe it or not. So this guy, Nathan Cohen, you can barely see up there, um, he went on a completely crazy attack writing. He, he, he would draft enormous numbers of emails to everybody involved in the Sage community, telling them to um, somehow oust me and or stop working on Sage. And um, in the end, everybody pointed out that the license that Sage has released under certainly allows Sage to be used as part of a product that a company sells. But he's just somehow some French guy who's extremely anti-commercial. So uh, at the end of the day, he decided to quit working on Sage. By the way, he was like the number four contributor of the last year. So it was um, um, a setback. But that's what it is. <clears throat> so just to summarize. I started a company, I'm focusing on it 100% for the foreseeable future. Uh, the main product is Sage Math Cloud right now, and our main target audience is professors teaching classes using open source software. So to make it easier for them to do so. And um, if the company is successful, then we'll be able to make Sage and really all other open source pure math software better. Thanks. Who? Co I've never met him. I wish. He's in France. I'm here. So I've never talked with Nathan Cohen or met him. Um, he looks pretty dangerous, though. What? What? This is his website. Just, if you go to his website, this is his statement on his website. It's like the landing page of... So, But he, he posted a, a huge number of emails on the Sage Develop mailing list and so on. I mean, before this started, he also, um, uh, well, a couple of years ago, I don't know, he's a, he's a difficult personality, um, let's just say. No, no, definitely not. We, had to, we introduced a code of conduct into the project because of 
him making a lot of certain people feel uncomfortable and, and stuff. So not like a typical mathematician. Um, uh, next question. John, oh, John. John. Oh, I was just wondering, in the last thing, you described what you wanted to do, but it wasn't clear to me how, how you make any money doing that specific thing you mentioned, you know, making it available to superficial classes and stuff. Yeah, um, we have a website. The business model is freemium. You can use it for free. However, um, if you pay, then there are many things that are better about how the website works. So it's it's software as a service. What? Yeah, it's not really like that. It's just it's software as a service. It's more like how uh, like let's see. There's a lot of examples of this. Spotify or something. There's there's yeah. versions of listening to music. Pandora, Lawn, Lawn, um, you Google it, Play. Does uh, that work in other contexts? Yeah. Software as a service is a extremely um, successful business model over the last few years. It was pioneered by Salesforce originally in the late '90s. Um, that's like a, I mean, they have $6 billion a year in revenue right now, so that's a big company for organizing corporate sales. Um, but there's a lot of other, let's, Games use it a lot. Games, I guess. It's, yes. <laughs> it's probably, I mean, it's gen, generally more, um, yeah. Yeah, like you can, uh, when you, if you have Gmail, for example, Google Apps, it's software. Um, like uh, interactive spreadsheets and, you know, have you ever used Google Docs? It, that is an example of software as a service. You, you go to a website and then you use a bunch of software. It's free if you're just sort of ge some general person, but often universities will buy a campus license for it or businesses will buy a license for it and they get uh, various enterprise-like features, like they get better user management, more disk space, no ads, that sort of thing. Um, your, your university probably pays for Google Apps. Um, so that's that's a very... A clear example of software as a service. This is similar to that. Um, yes? So I think my earlier question is actually there was a lot of misunderstanding. So I okay. think Tom played Conom, but I was just kind of mixing up Sage Math and Sage Math Cloud. So right. as a question of do you think Sage Math Cloud could benefit from you know industries such as like finance, et cetera, taking yep. advantage of Sage Math Cloud services over for instance Jupyter or maybe some other kinds of development environments without sacrificing the core of Sage Math. Right, so, so your question is, could SageMath Cloud be a lot more general, just as Feitman suggested, um, than just pure math research? And the answer is absolutely. Um, SageMath Cloud is, in fact, already being used a lot outside of mathematics. I think math, math is really just a small part of the user base. Um, our, the people using it in classes, it's really all across STEM, and it's used in some companies. It's used for training for people to use software in some companies. Um, and we also, everything is open source across the board, Julia, Octave, it's all kind of uniformly supported, Jupyter Notebooks in SageMath Cloud. So it's, and also has a LaTeX editor, I mean, which has, LaTeX editing is very different than, you know, using pure math research soft, computational software, but that's a really core feature of SageMath Cloud. So yes, for that software, we are uh, making it very broadly useful, and um, that is because it, I mean, it makes the product uh, more useful to people. Um, it's, it's not Sage, it's a different thing. Yeah. I think it's that happened in the work case where every, like, everyone has to take math classes to go into any kind of finance or whatever. Yep. They see Sage, they might get used to it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, in the back. Yeah, this is maybe, I don't mean this is a frivolous question, but I'm just thinking about Shark Tank. But, but would it be of any use to you to, to make presentations to these uh, entrepreneurial people who are just looking, venture capitalists? Uh, I went to Andreessen Horowitz last September. That's you know one of the most famous VC firms in Silicon Valley. They saw, so I gave a talk similar to this talk at the Harvard BP conference in June, and then some people at Andreessen Horowitz saw it for some reason, and then they invited me to tell them about uh, what I was doing. So I have you know talked with people, um, and there are there is investment. I mean, this company has investment from some serious people. But I don't have any investment from venture capitalists, only it's angel investment, but at a non-trivial level. Um, so there are investors in the company. There's a board. Next board meeting is in two weeks in San Francisco. Yes? <clears throat> just a comment from my perspective as a teacher at Hayden College here. And you know, just thinking about why they might use MATLAB over 
sage, mm -hmm. even if they were equal. I mm -hmm. think that their consideration is trying to prepare the student for what they see in industry or what they see in their job or even what they'd see at a university and where they're going to go in. So I think if that began to change, it would change the educational consideration as well. I think it's different perhaps in universities because we're not when we're preparing for the yeah, university. It's the, same, it's the same thing here. Like the engineers need smart boxes, the engineers everywhere need smart boxes. So it's the same use. Why they don't use boxes, I don't know because they're practically well, MATLAB is better than Octave. It, it, isn't, it shouldn't be a shocker that with 4,000 employees and a billion dollars a year in revenue, you can make something have a few less bugs and be a little faster with the same language as something that this guy is trying to develop on a shoestring budget with some other people. It is, MATLAB is actually better than Octave. It's objectively better. If you can, I mean, if you have the choice and you can afford the $140,000, it's not surprising people go with MATLAB. One issue is the lack of, there's other issues um, that are, they're, I mean, they're exactly what I said, but like the very, the user interface isn't as good. The actual graphical interface, the command line interface maybe. The graphical inter Jupyter Notebooks help address that. Um, and Jupyter, the whole Jupyter Notebook project is not like a cheap thing, like the Moore and Sloan Foundations and so on have put $10 million into just that project, more or less, maybe more. So that's a really expensive thing to develop. Is that going to survive? I honestly they don't know. I mean, Fernando Perez told me there was like a year of work to get the first big grant for, for uh, Jupiter. And then another, I mean, it's an incredible amount of work to get those sort of grants and then to get them repeatedly. And it's very hard. I don't know whether that will survive. And I feel sorry. I've met some of the people that work on it full time and they're working full time on software, but they're the sort of people that would like to maybe have an academic job afterwards. They just graduated with their PhD. Are they going to get one after working on that software? They'll probably leave because the grants will end and then they'll go into industry and then we, we will lose them. That's my guess, but maybe I'm being overly pessimistic. Although, I don't know, my experience the last 10 years makes me feel like I'm only, I'm only being overly optimistic. Who will keep Jupiter running for that? That's the big question. I don't know. Maybe I will keep Jupiter running to this company. You might. I might very well. losing the R, but they have been, you know, I talked to a representative and they've been very aggressive at getting universities offering free copies of SAS to all students. So the students don't have to think about it, they're not paying. And just so that the students are trained in SAS and the R, so then the companies will have to use SAS and not work. I mean, just to be clear, if I had significant financial resources, I view um, salespeople who do that as an important part of what it would take for Sage to be a viable alternative to the MAs. I mean, having people that could go out and go to a campus, do a demo in their lab, just like Mathematica sends people out to do that, do presentations, hold hands, um, answer support requests, like that's part of being a viable alternative to the MAs. Um, in order to compete with them, it's important to provide similar capabilities and hand holding when necessary. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of things that companies do to get customers to be happy. Yep. Do you see now or do you foresee in the future um, academic institutions being more putting more emphasis on software development, on the contribution, significant contribution to Sage as opposed to just publications? Because I was actually at, I was a grad student in Georgia where John Hankey did the same Yep. So I know, I know sort of a little bit about the situation. I'm just wondering what you think now or in the future. What I, my best guess is that things, will, things, things got worse since how they were 10 years ago um, because a lot of the people who would have made things better left academia. I mean, it's simple as that. Like, there's a whole generation of young people who 
where my grad students and other people's grad students doing a lot of stuff on math software. And I totally imagine they're all going to get jobs as professors, and then they would be the next generation that makes it so that um, contributions to Sage, for example, or like journal publications are on an equal footing. But instead, they work at Google. And um, that's, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's mo mostly what happens. These people are very well, well qualified for a great job there. Uh, academia doesn't appreciate them nearly as much as they would need to be appreciated to stay in academia. And so that's that. So I don't think it'll get better um, in the immediate future. I can't think of a way to change that yet. I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want to sound like Donald Trump either, but um, but I mean, there, there's a clear mechanism at work, which is that uh, exactly the people that would have changed things are not here, they're elsewhere. So. So besides this uh, French uh, person. Yeah. Development, core contributions to, to Sage are better than ever. I mean, we're having, as always, 100, you know, 100 people in each release who contributed code. There's a ton of stuff going on. Um, Sage is doing really, really well. I do nothing except you know, like watch the messages and occasionally make a remark. The project is self-sustaining at present and doing really, really well. It's just definitely never, ever going to make even a slightest step towards its actual mission statement with the current trajectory. And there's, I think, a cliff when that grant runs out, Open Dream Kit, because that's a critical thing. There's also the lead, the, um, the current uh, release manager. He's, he's like half, maybe not employed. I'm not really sure what's going on with him, but I'm, I'm seriously worried about his employment situation. And you know, it's, it's like it's doing really well, but what's going to happen when that grant ends? It's a really unusual grant. It's across all of Europe. It's incredibly hard to get. I mean, they're not going to just get it again. Um, so, there, there does seem uh, it's, it's hard. To, I mean, part of the evaluation you just did is, is looking at it from an American point of view, and it's not clear whether it's exactly the same in Europe, and whether it's better or worse. And it's it's pretty clearly different. It's better in Europe. Can you elaborate it why there's a difference between Europe and the US? The way I had no clue. Well, I mean, in Europe, there was a cross Europe grant last year that was awarded last year to support open source software. In America, there's almost nothing. There's the only grant I know of for Sage in all of the United States right now from the NSF is one single grant that Greg Musiker has for some Sage Days workshops at um, IMA. And that's it. And it's, you know, orders of magnitude, like a hundredth, you know, it's like 2% of the money of the European thing. So there's, it's just a different level of funding, and they care more. Yeah. All you know, like all the systems that are that uh, Sage builds out of are European. Gap, Perry, Singular, Python even started in Amsterdam. So I mean, it's really uh, an anomaly that us Americans had an impact on open source math software. I mean, we do. Americans typically introduce closed source yeah. software. <clears throat> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Sage okay. uh, right. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. There will be a, uh, there's a dinner, and if anybody 